Destin forgot to turn his mic on. Can you grab that real quick, Merle? Oh, did you turn it on? One, two, one, two. Okay. So you did okay. I didn't turn it on on here. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome uh, here for our worship service today. We do ask God's Easter blessings be upon all of you. What a joyous day today is. It is the day that the Lord has made. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we do pray that you will be blessed today abundantly and that your faith will be strengthened through the proclamation of his life-giving word and the good news that our hymns today declare. So we'll begin our Easter celebration by turning to hymn 6. And we're going to sing, as you may have noted there, verses 1 and 4. So we continue with the versicles that are printed in your bullet. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen. Let us then confess our sins with hearts that are truly sorry and obtain forgiveness by his infinite grace and mercy. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, I have sinned against you through my own fault, in thought, word, and deed. For the sake of the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Forgive me all my sins and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord has granted us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, grace to repentance and amendment of life, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I now ask you concerning your Christian faith. Do you believe in God, Father Almighty? Yes. Do 
Do you believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the hope of glory, the resurrection of the Amen. We turn now to hymn 352 and we'll sing verse 1. People have said that we are living in a clown world right now. Up is down and down is up. Right is wrong and wrong is right. We can see it with our own eyes. Our culture and our whole world grows more and more ungodly. And at the same time, it is becoming more and more antagonistic against the Christian faith. I saw a, re a recent poll that found only 23% of Generation Z, people born in the, the mid-90s, attend church on a weekly basis, while almost 40% have nothing to do with the Christian faith at all. That's our leaders tomorrow. Satan has convinced more and more people that the Christian faith, and in particular, the Easter story, is just that. It's a story. No different than a nursery rhyme or any other religions and their stories. But this story is unlike any other story that you've ever heard. Because the Easter story is absolutely true. It's absolutely real. And the history that you're about to hear is really his story. The Lord's story of defeating sin, defeating evil, and bringing that glorious victory to all of us. So let us listen carefully as we turn to our first lesson this morning, taken from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they recount the event of Jesus appearing to the women at the grave. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Sol James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on in the morning of the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. But when the women looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. 
When they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, they bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, don't be alarmed. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went to the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to stay. His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Here ends our first reading. We join together now in singing verse 1 of hymn 345. John's Gospel, we draw a second lesson where we hear of Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at his head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell him, excuse me, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to Mary, No, let me say that again. 
Jesus said to her, and he spoke her name, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said these things to her. Here ends the reading of our second lesson. We join together in singing verse 1 of hymn 354. Our third reading comes from Luke's Gospel, where he records the event of our Lord appearing to the two disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of Scripture concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. 
Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Here ends our third lesson. And now we will sing verse 1 of hymn 351. So our fourth reading comes from the Gospels of Luke and John as we hear of Jesus appearing twice to the huddled disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and, and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. They are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Here ends the reading of our fourth lesson. We join together in singing the first verse of hymn 356.
So in our final reading this morning, we hear the Apostle Paul explain to us the blessed fruits of Christ's resurrection. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am who I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. But if, the preached, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead and the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so ends the final reading of our history of Easter. However, the power and the joy of The Easter victory never ends. We join now in singing the last two verses of hymn 356.
And so for our message here this morning, we turn to verses 11 through 18, specifically of John's gospel. And I invite you to rise for that gospel reading. Mary stood outside, facing the tomb, weeping. As she wept, she bent over, looking into the tomb. She saw two angels in white clothes sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? She told them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. After she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, though she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing that he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you carried him off, tell me where you laid him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and replied in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus told her, do, do not continue to cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. She also told them the things he said to her. Thus our text, and you may be seated. May God's amazing grace and resurrection peace be unto all of you through our Lord and our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's true, dear ones. Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. So, dear fellow believers in the risen Christ, just out of curiosity, I want you to raise your hand if you if maybe you had gone to the theater, this would have been many years ago, and you saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Anybody go to the theater and see that? Okay. Well, I saw the movie as well. In fact, it's the only movie that I've ever seen in a theater twice. And it's the only movie that I've watched at a theater where I didn't have any popcorn or soda. Somehow it just didn't feel right to be watching my Lord's crucifixion while popping popcorn in my mouth and chugging some soda. I saw it twice because one time we took our youth group and the second time we took our adult group. And the interesting thing is what happened at both times, and maybe you can relate to this too, those who saw it at the theater. When the movie ended and the lights came on, there was silence. Nobody was talking. Nobody was certainly clowning around. There was just silence, except for the numerous sniffles and wiping of eyes. And even some grown men were doing that as well. We had just witnessed through film the brutally hellish torture and crucifixion of Jesus. And yet, even though a lot of the gory details were clearly depicted, it wasn't like the slasher movies that are popular today. The violence that went on there was different. We knew that those wounds were suffered willingly for each of us. By his wounds, we are healed. Now, as many of you know, we've spent the last seven weeks looking at the Lord's final steps that took him to various places and to various people during the actual holy week of history. And then it ended with what we called Good Friday, his crucifixion. And when it comes to that movie, The Passion of the Christ, there is no doubt that that movie was powerful. It was memorable. It was impactful. But the record of Scripture itself is even better because today we learn about his, not final, but first steps 
that led outside his tomb. You see, the work that Jesus had come to do was done. Mission accomplished. But now it was time to announce our Lord's victory by appearing to those who still thought he was dead. So now the focus shifts, doesn't it? And so our Lord's first step led to Mary. The same Mary who didn't recognize the two angels. The same Mary who thought the gar- or that Jesus was the gardener. And the same Mary who would witness to us all by declaring, I have seen the Lord. So what I want to do this morning is, is explore those victorious steps together. Now, think about this. If merely watching a movie about Christ's crucifixion is enough to leave us feeling exhausted and emotionally drained, just imagine what it was like for the Lord's first disciples who actually lived through the nightmare of Good Friday. And it might be a reasonable question to ask, Was that day perhaps even more horrific for the women, like Mary Magdalene, who followed Jesus? After all, John reveals to us in his gospel earlier on, he says that Jesus' mother, excuse me, that Jesus' mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing right near the cross. They were up close. And it was personal. But these women, who loved their Lord so much, were also the very first ones to visit the tomb on Easter morning. The Bible tells us they were carrying their their spices because they were coming not only to prepare the Lord's body properly, which didn't get done on Friday, but also to pay their final respects to their dead teacher. And then the Bible also reveals to us what they were thinking. That as the women drew closer to the tomb, they started wondering and worrying even as to how they would move that massive stone out of the way so that it could prepare his body. And then there were other concerns too, like how are they going to talk their way past those guards? And how could they break the official seal that Pontius Pilate had ordered to be put on that stone? They didn't know. Evidently, they were thinking, well, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. And the reason probably for that is because they were still in shock. And that certainly included Mary Magdalene, who went to the tomb at the crack of dawn. But what we learn is that the first time Mary arrived there, guess what? That stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she left and ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. And she said to him, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they put him. And after sharing that report, Mary followed Peter and John who went running to the tomb. And they arrived, or as they arrived, they went right in as we heard scripture declaring to us. They checked it all out. And sure enough, the tomb was totally empty. Yes, the body of Jesus. It was gone. Just the linens lying there where Jesus had been. So what did they do? They went back home. What else could they do? I got a pretty good suspicion that they thought those rascal Romans or the Jewish leaders took the body during the night and put it somewhere so that no one could... Could see him. But you know, John goes even further as to add that unflattering comment when he says, They still did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. But before we get or come down too hard on these disciples, let's be honest with ourselves. There are times, lots of them, that we can be a little slow in grasping the height, depth, length, power, and the certainty of all of God's promises. And we're on the side of 
on this side, I should say, of that story. We know all about it, don't we? No, we know how it ends. We know what happened. It's undoubtedly difficult, even more so, I would say, for the disciples because of how challenging this was. They were living this in real time. And so our text tells us, it goes on, it says, Mary stood outside facing the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent over looking into the tomb. She saw two angels in white, white clothing, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they asked her, woman, why are you weeping? We know, of course, don't we? Mary's heart was utterly, thoroughly broken. She was in a state of shock. She couldn't see, really, what was right in front of her. Two angels. You would think under normal conditions, that might get your attention. But it just wasn't registering. All she could think of was this. They've taken away the body of our Lord... And I don't know where they did it. I don't know where they laid him. Nobody seems to know. You see, we need to understand that she was stuck in that nightmare that took place on Good Friday. Christ's bloodied and tortured body hanging from that center cross. Then Christ's lifeless body later being hastily laid in a tomb. Those were the images that were seared into her heart and her mind. And that's why she's weeping. That's why she's sobbing. Some might even say uncontrollably. Because as far as Mary knew, her master was dead. And along with his death, died all the promises. All of those hopes, all of those dreams that she had tucked away in her heart from all of those times that she heard him preaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And she, along with some other women, followed Jesus, the Bible tells us, traveling from one town and village to another. This is the one, I'm sure they were convinced. And anyone who has experienced severe trauma may understand better than most what Mary was going through that very first Easter morning. And it would certainly explain why she seemed oblivious to angels sitting there in the tomb. Her being frozen in that spot and struggling to think through her next move. But our Savior, who is truly a caring Savior beyond compare, who understands each one of us better than we understand ourselves. He knew exactly what Mary needed. Now you'll note that John's account is both poignant and personal. It's amazing. All of the little details that he includes here. Amazing because John penned this record some 60 years after the resurrection. I can't even remember what I had for lunch yesterday, let alone 60 years ago. 60 years, I think I was sucking my thumb, maybe. Maybe I'd gotten past that. But how is it that John could remember all of this? Well, it was because of the Holy Spirit. By inspiration, made every detail sharp and clear in John's heart, mind, and soul. Listen again to what he says here in verses 14 and 15. After she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, though she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And she's thinking he's the gardener, so she says to him, sir, if you carried him off, tell me where you laid him and I'll go and get him. Now, there have been a number of Reasons, notions as to why Mary didn't recognize him. One being that our Savior kept her from recognizing him at first. It's possible. He's God. He can do anything he wants. Another notion is that Mary's eyes were just so blurred that she didn't recognize Jesus. 
You might do a, well, duh, slap to our forehead. I mean, she was weeping and sobbing. This was gut-wrenching sorrow. So, of course, her eyes are going to be red and blurred. And then the third possibility, Jesus may have actually looked different than he did before the resurrection. And there might be some merit to that as well, because we heard there in our readings that on Easter Sunday afternoon, Cleopas and another disciple were walking down that road to, Messiah, uh, to sorry, Emmaus, and suddenly there's the resurrected Jesus walking along with them, and they didn't recognize him either. And of course, we understand that their hearts were filled with sorrow as well. And I think we would all agree that Jesus would have been the very last person that they'd ever expect to see on that road to Emmaus because of the nightmare. And it was on Good Friday. How could anyone recognize the living Lord when all you have churning around in your brain are the horrors that you would witness there in Golgotha. And the women being right there at his cross, witnessing all of this. But I want us to think just a little deeper. Do you and I, do we ever get stuck in the hopelessness of Good Friday, of our own Good Friday, that we see reflected in the lives of these followers? What do I mean by that? Well, do we ever get stuck grieving over a spouse or a parent or a child that we felt or maybe st still feel that the Lord took them home far too soon? Do we ever get stuck worrying about how we're going to pay our bills now that we're out of a job because the company is downsized or that our paychecks just can't keep up with the rising costs of literally everything. Do we ever get stuck worrying about another coronavirus making a comeback? In fact, well, I won't even say that. But it has been predicted another pandemic is around the corner. And what about our retirement savings? as outrageous federal and state spending is causing our dollars that we have to be worth less and less and less. And then that we might be asking, how will our congregation and our gospel ministry here move forward during these uncertain times? There are so many concerns and so many fears that threaten to keep you and me mired in the bleakness of Good Friday. And the truth is, there is only one way to roll back those massive stones of fear and worry and weeping. It's Easter. Only Easter can do that. And the risen Savior, who, who knew exactly what Mary needed that very first Easter Sunday, he knows exactly what we need this Easter Sunday. We need to rivet our attention on Jesus, the risen and living Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to see how our Lord's first steps led outside his tomb to Mary, who witnessed to us all with her glorious words, I have seen the Lord. And by the way, did you know it, that it only took just one word, right? For Jesus to lift that fog and that fear and that darkness from her heart and mind. Just one word. To free her feet and to cause her to turn to her Savior and run to him and hug him so so very tightly. Listen again how it went. Jesus said to her, Mary, bingo. And she turned and replied in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
And she ran to him. She grabbed hold of him. And the Lord has to say, do not continue to cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go and tell my brothers, and that's significant too, I'll mention in just a moment. And tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them the things he said to her. So, look at the picture that we have before us. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, who had finished his work to pay in full the sins of the whole human race, the one who had chained Satan and his minions in the dungeons of hell and had already descended there to declare his eternal victory, the one whom the heavenly Father would exalt and give him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're talking about the risen and glorious Christ who is the good shepherd. And he cares about us. And he knows all of his sheep, every last one, by name. And he knows you. So Jesus simply said, Mary and the darkness of Good Friday began to be pierced by the sunlight that is Easter. Rabboni, teacher, came the reply. Now, I suspect that her tears continued because that's, of course, the way human emotions work, right? You can't just turn them off like a faucet. But now the tears became tears of surprise, of wonder of overflowing joy and a relief that swept through Mary like waves. So she immediately hugged her Lord. She held him tight. This was clinging in every sense of the word. She didn't want to ever let him go again. But that wasn't going to work because the risen Jesus had places to go other people to see, and more names like Thomas, for example, to speak to. Because our Savior intended to have hundreds and hundreds of witnesses ready to swear on the pages of Scripture, I have seen the Lord. So see, dear ones, his first steps led outside his tomb, and Jesus made sure that Mary was met by him because he knew she needed him. Then the Lord sent Mary to his brothers to share the Easter news with them because they knew, I'm sorry, he knew that they needed him too. And through the pages of Scripture, Mary and so many others stand shoulder to shoulder, crying out in one voice, We have seen the Lord. And then you've got Peter writing in his second letter, to be sure we were not following cunningly devised fables when we had made known to you the powerful appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then finally John, who now is an old man, but could never forget as he writes in 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have observed, and our own hands have touched regarding the word of life. The life appeared and we've seen it. We testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We are proclaiming what we have seen and heard also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. Together, all of the witnesses shout to all of us, Easter is real. The Lord's forgiveness of all our sins, that's real. And see, Jesus made that crystal clear when he sent Mary with a message for his brothers. 
Of course, that was brothers and sisters. Because even that greeting was pure grace. Undeserved love because that victorious and loving me message was intended for those who had scattered like scared rabbits into the night outside of Gethsemane just a few days earlier. And there is that same pure grace for all of us too. We who sometimes get stuck in our own Good Friday nightmares. Because you see, the writer to the Hebrews assures us that the risen Lord is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. That's why he came. That's why he took every one of those final steps to that center cross on Calvary. And that's why his first steps led outside his tomb. Because Christ is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And so please rise for the blessing. And now may the glorious peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen and living Christ. Amen. You may be seated. This has become our traditional time to make your presence known through our worship participation. Ah, I can't talk today, can I? Worship participation cards. Uh, and so let your presence be known. If you're visiting with us today and you'd like to know more about our ministry, well then include uh, your name, address, or any way in which we can make contact with you. We'd love to tell you more about us. Uh, also, for anyone here, if you have a prayer request that you'd like me to be praying uh, about uh, throughout the week, well, you can include that on that card too. And then place it in the uh, offering plate in the back of church. And so let us pray. Precious Savior Jesus Christ, we thank and praise you that by your suffering on the cross you endured the very agony of hell in our place and that by your death you have reconciled us to God. But on this Easter morning especially, we thank and praise you for your resurrection from the dead because it proves that you are God's Son and seals your sacrifice as the full payment for all our sins. May we never cease to praise you with our hearts and lives for all that you have so graciously done to accomplish our salvation. And Lord, as you are raised up and glorified in your body, raise us up by the Spirit from spiritual deadness to trust in you with all our hearts and to serve you in godliness all our days. Fill our hearts with joy as we look with longing to the day of your glorious reappearing when you will raise all the dead from their graves and comfort us with the knowledge that on that day our lowly bodies will arise in the likeness of your own glorious resurrection body. Dear Father, as we come to you this glorious day, we are truly sorry for our sins. Be merciful to us and pardon us for the sake of your Son, Jesus, whom you raised from the dead. And please accept our praises as they come from humble yet joyful hearts by your Spirit. Strengthen our faith, help us live Christian lives, and increase our will to give all for our living Savior's sake, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now with believing hearts, receive our Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant to you his peace.
And so let us close with hymn 348. Very good. A warm and blessed thank you to all of you for coming to God's house on this uh, blessed morning and being a part of our Easter praises and celebration. And it is our hope that you have been edified and strengthened in your faith through God's word and the music and that you will worship with us regularly. Just real quick, a special thanks to Nancy for providing the music for our Easter celebration today but also for our Good Friday uh, service. And to you, Mary Haig, uh, thank you for your special music at our Good Friday service as well. And to you, Beth Floor, uh, for your solo. We appreciate all of that. And a big thank you to our youth and their families. I know as the Haig crews were there and the Nisslers and everyone who helped with the Easter breakfast, uh, all I kept hearing from people was how delicious it was. So. Thank you for that, and thank you for the food donations, for all the work involved in providing that wonderful breakfast and fellowship time. Also, let me thank those who helped prepare, prepare our sanctuary for our Easter service, our banners, the big banners. Uh, what else? Oh, the lilies, of course, yeah. Uh, thank you for that, and everything else that was involved. God bless uh, all of you, and may... He bless you with a joyous Easter day. May the joy and the assurance of this day fill your hearts and your minds always. Happy Easter, everyone. Oh, announcements. Announcements, announcements. What a horrible way to die, right? No, just real quick. Uh, you see them there uh, written in the bulletin. But if you uh, donated a lily, you can pick them up today and take them home. Uh, school board's meeting this week, so that's at 5 o'clock. And uh, then next week we go back to our regular schedule, so 9 a.m. Uh, Bible class and Sunday school and the 1015 worship service. Also, there's a little note back there about July Hometown Pride. Um, is that still back there, Linda, the, the list? Okay. So if you can help us out, maybe you don't know what time yet, just go ahead and put your name on there because we are going to do it, okay? But I'm going to need your help. All right, so check that out and all the other announcements as well. Uh, again, may uh, God bless your daily walk with the risen Christ. Amen.